We can do it, the story of Rosie the Riveter. Rosie the Riveter was a cultural icon used in propaganda campaigns by the United States government with the goal of influencing women to join the workforce as well as the war effort during World War II. During World War II, Rosie the Riveter became the symbol of working women, empowering and influencing them to claim their places in the workforce. Thus, the traditional American household was forever altered. Before World War II, the man of the home worked to support his family, and the woman stayed home to care for the home and children. The home was a protected place before World War II. Families decided what information, ideas, and people entered their homes. The Beginning of World War II the media compromised the ideal living space for families in the early 1940s. After the war began, there was so much propaganda and war talk that it was hard to stay away from. The bombing of Pearl Harbor, Hawaii on December 7, 1941 dragged America into the Second World War and brought about many emotional responses. The first reaction to the bombing of Pearl Harbor was a sudden increase in marriages. During the days immediately after America joined World War II, the Cook County, Illinois clerk issued marriage licenses at two times the typical rate. Many young people got married after being in short relationships so they could be married before the husband would be shipped off to war. Bonds created between people who had only known each other for a short period of time were called furlough romances. The women with husbands at war, particularly the wives with no children who married shortly after America joined the World War, were referred to as war brides. Weight, worry, and loneliness came after the spontaneous marriage decisions and the departures of their husbands into the military. This depression state was referred to as the New Plague. Most war brides ignored experts' advice to move back home with their parents. Many war brides spent time in bars as an attempt to subdue their depression. A Chicago priest during World War II commented on their new hobby and said, They are just trying to fill the time, I suppose, but they are developing habits that their husbands would not like to think of them having. The almost immediate departure of their husbands into the military delayed the creation of a traditional household, which created problems for the war brides. A Chicago consultant for the Chicago-based Association for Family Living recommended that war brides without children live and spend time with each other. Childless war brides were also encouraged to join the workforce and become a part of the war effort. During World War II, many factory positions were left empty because the men that once filled them prior to World War II abandoned their jobs for the military. There was also a higher demand for factory workers because America needed war supplies. In order to meet the demand of factory workers needed, the American government used propaganda campaigns to influence women to claim their places in the workforce. One of the most popular, successful, and well-known government campaigns aimed at women during World War II was Rosie the Riveter. Rosie was a feminine, loyal, patriotic, smart, strong, pretty, and efficient woman. She was created in a way that would make women want to emulate her. She was a fictional character, a cultural icon, a symbol of feminism and patriotism, as well as a role model for all working women during World War II. The term Rosie the Riveter was first used in 1942 in the popular song Rosie the Riveter by the Four Vagabonds. The lyrics speak about how patriotic and hardworking she is. The song tells the story of the life of a common war bride. The song made Americans fall in love with the image of Rosie the Riveter. The first popular image of Rosie the Riveter was Norman Rockwell's depiction of the strong patriotic woman who looked ready to work. The image first appeared on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post on May 29, 1943. What people believed to be the most popular depiction of Rosie the Riveter was created in 1942 by J. Howard Miller. It was created to be displayed in a select number of Westinghouse factories during a short period of time in 1943. Even though the poster wasn't popular until it resurfaced years later, it kept the image of Rosie the Riveter alive, and it is still recognized by Americans today. Rosie and her concept are so iconic that women in the workforce during World War II, particularly working in factories, were and are still often referred to as Rosies. Rosie expressed the economic power of women. She also influenced women to become a part of the workforce by expressing influential messages such as we can do it and stressing the political need for women to join the workforce. She was one of the most successful recruitment tools in United States history. As a result of the Rosie the Riveter propaganda campaign, the percentage of women in the workforce from the beginning of World War II to the end of World War II increased by 10%. Rosie commonly produced war supplies, specifically aircraft parts. She was usually depicted as a riveter in an aircraft factory, hence the name Rosie the Riveter. It is obvious that Rosie was a huge influence to women between the years of 1942 and 1945 because the aviation industry had the largest increase in female employees. Based on a survey taken in 1943, more than 310,000 women worked in the United States aircraft industry. Prior to World War II, only 1% of the aviation industry's workforce was composed of women. By the end of World War II, women made up 65% of the U.S. aircraft industry's workforce. It is evident that Rosie the Riveter was a role model to the 
the 18 million females working in the workforce during World War II. Rosie had a huge impact on women. They loved her so much and wanted to be just like her, and that meant having the same job as her, too. We can thank Rosie the Riveter for all of our military airplanes, weapons, and ammunition that helped to end World War II. Some Americans felt that an increase in female workers would result in an increase of juvenile delinquents because mothers would no longer be home to care for their children. Some citizens also believed that working women without a husband would not be able to find one. Many believed that a woman's greatest asset was the ability for her to care for her family. Working women during World War II were inspired by Rosie the Riveter. She convinced many of them to join the workforce. Patriotism influenced women to join the workforce as well. As a result, women went to work not only feeling patriotic, but they also felt important. Working helped to create a new self-image for women, which made them feel important, equal, and capable of doing a man's work. That new self-image empowered women. Even though the American government needed the help of women and they were recruiting women to join the workforce, they discouraged women with children under the age of 14 from getting jobs because they feared that a rise in working mothers would result in a rise of juvenile delinquents. Many mothers that did work during World War II had child care issues. The government was in such desperate need for help that they went so far as to recruit women to join the workforce right out of high school. The government's call for help was answered. Some women had such a huge desire to work and become a part of the war effort that they lied about their age. By 1944, there were more than 18 million women in the workforce. More than 2.3 million women worked in the United States war industries. Like men, women quit their jobs if they were unhappy or didn't like the pay, location, or work environment. Unlike men, women worked double shifts. Not only did they have to work all day, but they also had to go home and care for the house and family. As more women entered the workforce, the attitudes towards them change. After a while, the once conformed and traditional citizens that did not accept the new lifestyles of women learned to accept the temporary changes of wives and mothers in the workforce due to the war. Not only were the women a part of the workforce, but they were also empowered and influenced to become a part of the military. Of course, many women were nurses for the military during World War II, but there were 100,000 women in the Women's Auxiliary Army, where they completed tasks that could be done better by women rather than by male soldiers. The women in the Women's Auxiliary Army assisted the American Army with non-combat tasks. There were also 11,000 female Coast Guards during World War II and 1,800 female Marines. 86,000 women were also accepted to the Volunteer Emergency Service during World War II. The concept of Rosie the Riveter and women working didn't happen all at once. The creation of Chicago's Rosie the Riveter came in stages. When World War II first began, most Chicago men took second jobs and increased work hours to contribute to the war effort and bring home more money. Chicago had a low demand for female workers at the beginning of World War II. When women first began to join Chicago's workforce, officials and plant managers were hostile and indifferent towards the idea of female workers, especially mothers. Many Chicago businesses, as well as businesses across the entire nation, hired women between the ages of 18 and 30. Not only were there age limits, but there were also limitations on the job positions that women could have. Many Chicago businesses, such as Studebaker, only allowed women to do office work. In September of 1943, Chicago was led to an extreme labor shortage due to Chicago's men leaving their jobs to join the military. Only 75,000 Chicago women had jobs during 1943. As a result of the labor shortage, Chicago employers intensified their calls for female employees and began hiring single and married women with children above the age of 14. As an attempt to aid the labor shortage, industrialists and civic leaders launched recruiting drives. When women began working to contribute and improve the labor shortage, the industrialists and civic leaders recognized the women as the region's saviors. In February of 1944, Chicago's mayor, Edward J. Kelly, issued an appeal. The appeal was the first women's only recruiting call in Chicago's history. Chicago businesses that were desperate for new labor contracts took job recruiting to a new level that infringed on the privacy of women. One example would be door-to-door -door recruiting by North Chicago businesses, which occurred six days a week. As a result of Chicago's efforts to improve and eliminate the labor shortage, 300,000 women were a part of the Chicago workforce by June of 1944, which was a 110% increase since mid-1940. Chicago, Chicago had many Rosies, with many stories. One of the Rosies was Jenny Jean Greco, a riveter. The Douglas Aircraft Company, the Corporation of Army Engineers, the Civil Aeronautics Authority, the Chicago Association of Commerce, and the Chicago Regional Planning Association wanted to increase the production of airplanes during World War II, so they chose a location on the northwest side of Chicago, which they believed would be less likely to be bombed by enemy planes. The first C-4 Skymaster was made on July 30, 1943, and completed by Chicago's Rosie the Riveter, Jenny Jean Greco. She named it Chicago. After World War II, jobs for women disappeared because the men came back home and returned to the workforce. 
After World War II ended, many of women wanted to continue working. Most of the women that did stay in the workforce were put in a lower paying job position so the men could have the better jobs. Most women were laid off after the war. The changes of women during World War II were superficial and temporary. After the war ended, women in the workforce were again looked down upon by society. Most women no longer wanted to work after the war, so they returned to caring for their families full time. Even though the amount of women in the workforce decreased after World War II and it was no longer socially acceptable for women to work, the ideas and beliefs of women's equality filtered into the future. The road that was taken by women during World War II continued into the future and paved the path for women in the future. If it had not been for Rosie the Riveter and all of the Rosies during World War II, women would not have the job positions they are in today.